Hi, everybody. Um, well, I, I was really tempted to make uh, an entrance from the back, like a real rock star. Uh, but then I figured out that, well, rock stars sing and maybe talk about things like love, happiness, not scalability. So scalability is, uh, is, is, is not really, scalability is not really there. <laughs> Well, okay, uh, maybe I can make an entrance from the back again. So, <laughs> see if it works. Uh, okay. Uh, how to improvise? Is it me or? No, it's not me. It, now it's me. And also my friend. <laughs> Hi. Never leave Skype on before a presentation. OK, be serious. Uh, this is a presentation about scalability. Uh, because uh, essentially, I'm fed up of hearing, listening to customers uh, constantly, oh, our application must be scalable. No matter what, it must scale. What does it mean that it must scale? Scalability is a concept really, really abstract that in this talk, in the what's that? 58 and 31 seconds remaining, I'll try to make uh, simple, as simple as possible. So uh, the fundamental thing I will, the, 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 the key takeaway out of this session is uh, grabbing or fixing the definition or confirming, why not, the definition of scalability you may have in your mind in your brains, and hopefully manage to make it to be really the definition that works in your working environment. There will be a slide later on today where I say just one, just three words, context is king. So there is no globally, generally valid definition for scalability. It's what works, it is what works for you. And let's see what works for Microsoft, for example. This is a, you know, these are a couple of sentences, one in black and one in red, taken from uh, somewhere, the, uh, one of the three million pages you find out of the Microsoft website in the enterprise pages. They say in black, scalability is the ability of a system to expand to meet your business needs. Abstract, but undoubtedly true. But then there is the red second sentence that, okay, the red is my styling of the sentence, which says, you scale a system by adding extra hardware or by upgrading the existing hardware without changing much of the application. Well, true, false, said that it's neither true nor false. It's a kind of fuzzy logic in between here. This is a sentence uh, not, in my opinion, not really at the pace with the time we live on. Because the sentence says you upgrade, you scale the system adding extra hardware or upgrading the existing hardware without changing much of the application. This is the critical point that to me seems to be in contrast with the black first sentence of the slide and of the excerpt from the Microsoft site. Now, imagine a manager, not necessarily a highly technical people, reading this. The kind of person that then approaches you as a consultant or as an architect says, no matter what, the system must be scalable. I want it to be scalable. This is probably the definition it takes for that. And the definition here says two distinct things. It says uh, scalability is the ability, okay, and they understand, everybody understands that. It's a plain language. The second says, oh, adding extra hardware and not changing the app. So you developers, according to this definition, are not allowed 
to make huge changes to the source code to achieve scalability. And when you provide an estimate of the work that you reckon is necessary to make the application actually scalable, no, look, read. It's Microsoft saying this. Then there is a lot more than in the page where this excerpt comes from that explains and gives a definition of scalability that makes sense. Because in particular, the red sentence over there is matched to a concept called vertical scalability. There is also an horizontal form of scalability that has uh, the same effect of making the system able to scale, to expand, to meet your business needs, with, but taking different routes to that. And here is another definition taken from Wikipedia. Scalability is, uh, the, capabi scalability is the capability of a system network, blah, 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 to handle a growing amount of work or its potential to be enlarged in order to accommodate that growth. A growing amount of work. Keep this in mind as a synonym, as an excellent abstract, yet working everywhere and every time as far as scalability is concerned. It's about how you handle, how your system handles a growing amount of work. Beyond that, everyone talks scalability, everyone thinks everyone else is doing it, and everyone wants it. But the point is, what do you want exactly? Let's try to be more formal. Attributes of scalability. First and foremost, it has to be measurable. Whatever scalability means to you, must be measurable. You must be able to associate that vague idea to a number, a number that you can count on. Growing factor. What makes those numbers change? What? Which aspect, which feature, which business or technical feature, function, module, hardware, why not? Network constraint make those numbers you want to, you need to measure vary. And then the context. What is measurable and what is the growing factor in your context? Because what works for me, my company, my customer, my business domain, not necessarily works for you another company, another customer, another business domain, or even the same business domain, different contexts, different uh, scenarios, different requirements, different workflows, different processes. Context is absolutely relevant here. And this is a nice quote taken from uh, somewhere on a stack overflow, just uh, searching for uh, attributes of scalability. Not everything that matters can be measured, and not everything that can be measured matters. So again, it's about context. And it's about figuring out the primary element that make the context so alive, the growing factor, what determines a growing amount of work that can potentially characterize your system and that your software must be able to handle. Now, I can have many faces. I can be cool, I can be thoughtful, but do you think I'm scalable? Yes. No, 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 Venkat, don't, don't try. I'm not, I can be sexy maybe, but I'm not scalable at all. Now, and I told you everything. Okay, I can go now. <laughs> uh, are you recording? So I, it's on the record that I said that I'm sexy? Excuse me. <laughs> that, could be, that could be an issue. It could be quite of an issue. Anyway, I'm not scalable. Why? My, my son proven. This is the algorithm, the, the translation of an algorithm that my son um, okay, elaborated. So he said, 
that you are not scalable because uh, the, hard, that the hardest you can work with the best fine tuning tasks compared to a cozy, relaxed guy, well, you are not scalable because let's say that you can get as much as 10 euros of revenues a year. You, you, can, you do that and you probably double the amount of money, the revenues of a cozy, relaxed, easy guy because you are well organized, because you are okay, good at your job. You make twice as much money. But when it comes to, and, and if you would take a snapshot of this moment in time, you are doing much, much better. Your performance is absolutely great. Now, how much you can do, how, how much you can improve at some point in time? Let's we have a lot more, let's, let's try to measure how much resilient is you, me, in the context. Maybe I can squeeze out, improve yet more as much as possible my performance, my organization, and I can make as much as 12 euros a year. I have a physical limitation. I'm, I still have two, okay, one brain, so that, that's all that matters. No matter how many legs, how many arms I have, I still have one brain and a limited number of neurons. That's my physical limitation. I can, the, the best I can do to squeeze out money, I'm limited. But if I were a scalable kind of person, I could simply duplicate my business as many times as possible, but probably with an N factor significantly greater than one. So the five euros multiplied by N, two, three, four, not necessarily thousands of times, makes for a much, much larger amount of money or amount of performance. And if we try then to finally measure the stress, I'm in trouble, the other guy is enjoying life. So this means to be scalable. And uh, this also, this slide also attempts to show the concept of pure performance versus the concept of being actually scalable. I'm, as a person, as a non-scalable person, I can sometimes, and probably often I am able to produce a much better individual point, punctual performance. Yet over time, over a growing amount of work, I'm physically limited. And a different structure, a different vision of the world and vision of the system may be necessary to scale properly, at least for the amount of work that some applications, context again, may require today. So uh, me and the other scalable guy are presenting uh, two different approaches to scalability. I, that on the top, so on the line with my face, that is where you find uh, an idea of vertical scalability. More power, more power, more power, but a physical limitation, whether it's neurons or memory or a CPU cycles, SSD and whatever. On the other end, you have a a lighter kind of application, but a different architecture that can be replicated, and each replicated node can do its own amount of work, not with the maximum possible performance, but still, altogether, they offer a service that is able, definitely able, to face a growing amount of work. So if my small business is open today and to serve 10 people, I'm fine. 100 people, 1,000 people could require I open more shops, for example. That's it. Shops, check out lanes. 
Now, what I'm going to present is uh, two very basic stupid patterns for handling a checkout lane. Both works. I mean, uh, this is the pattern I found, I usually found, then cut, you can confirm that if you want, on airports when you apply for, for the passport checking. You, you have a many, many, many gates in front of you, and you have to choose the one in some airports, not everywhere, thanks God. You have to choose the one that, mm, at first sight, promises to be the shortest. Same when you go sometimes in a drug source to buy something. So, of course, I mean, you have a, a number of gates, a number of points of service that can perform the job, whatever it is, and uh, those uh, gates can be opened and closed at will. But the people coming in, so the number of requests should decide, and that requires somewhere, some logic, where to go. Uh, also called load balancing. It's a, a, a matter of which algorithm you use in the load balancing. Okay, software is pretty smart at this, but in life, in general, trying to figure out what is the scalability in life, and in software as part of that, it's about the algorithm we use in load balancing. This is a common pattern. And this is a <laughs> common pattern that runs against the Murphy law that the other lane always runs faster. Okay, be serious. Check out lane pattern number two. In some other airports, people are put in a single queue, and then some nice, pe nice persons are at the end of the queue and forward you towards the next available gate for passport control, whatever it is. You still have here a number of gates, uh, number of points of service, some open, some closed, and in both cases, uh, by closing or opening on demand a point of service, you can improve significantly the performance. Sure, you are still limited by the number of gates, but knowing statistically the total number of people that can possibly queue up, you can determine a reasonable number of gate of points of service, try to be as general as possible, to enable, to potentially enable. This is another pattern we find in life commonly, and both of them work, but not necessarily any of them may work for you. It depends on the application you have. Because of course, these two different patterns both working and both able to giving you the same potential for scalability have different psychological effects. When uh, you, you, you get into an airport and you see, wow, an endless queue of people, unique single queue of people, oh my God, it will take me ages. Because you are not led to think that there are so many concurrently acting points of service. So the, the, the queue, which is definitely long, is pretty fast, usually, to take you there. If we go here instead, we definitely see when we get, into the, when we get ready to the point of service, we definitely observe, likely observe, much shorter queue but you have no guarantees that the other lane is not faster than yours. So, okay, mathematically speaking, for the, towards the end of the world, towards infinite, maybe the function will go the same way, but the impact could be different, so you can have a, wow, impact, the, if I go there, there are only three people before me, so let me go there, and then maybe one of those three people gets stuck in the point of service, and you wait indefinitely for a longer time. That happened to me in Moscow a few months ago. I went in the airport, and I was so happy. I could showcase my diamond card, and I went straight to the queue reserved to 
diamond partners. Wow. <laughs> there were only two people in front of me and maybe 30 people queuing for the regular boarding. But one of those people in front of me had a problem that couldn't be solved. There was only one person taking care of diamond passengers. Uh, to make a long story short, I queued to the regular and I made it faster because the person behind me was still there when I was already on board and on the plane. So, <laughs> uh, okay, this is a, well, it's not a joke because it happened, it really happened, but uh, it gives the measure that every solution you choose, uh, generally speaking, to make it scalable, uh, may have uh, an impact, even when the al algorithmically speaking, uh, both are fine. So, Every solution, pattern one or pattern number two, are both great, but which one works for you depends on the context. And the context is your application and is your uh, customers. Why not? Now, trying to be more, even more uh, formal and start getting a little bit technical. I mentioned there are two essential, two different ways to handle scalability or to figure out scalability, vertical and horizontal. Now, the vertical scalability has been the norm for about for over 20 years, and I would say forever, in the sense that scalability started becoming uh, a mantra, I want to be scalable, I want to be scalable, I want to be scalable, uh, when the web became a reality which was more or less uh, 20 years ago with the internet bubble. Uh, vertical scaling, so give me more powerful hardware and uh, I'll make it work, uh, uh, was a, a functional and effective approach as long as the database was the central point of the architecture. Give me a strong enough database. Give me a monster and I can do everything. But that was the, the software architecture, the classic three-tier software architecture, centered around the database, maybe with uh, some Java or C++ layer of code on top of that, the, the, the mythical middle tier, and some Visual Basic or whatever, maybe HTML or Delphi or I don't know what, on top of that, using ODBC, remember that, to communicate the more powerful the database, the more queries, the more commands the database could handle, the more your application was able to react. It works, but it doesn't scale beyond a certain point. Uh, today, vertical scalability is uh, often achieved using front caching, which is uh, a relatively cheap and effective way to achieve that. So it consists of having proxy servers with uh, smart load balancing uh, uh, capabilities. Uh, uh, the nice thing about this and products like Squid, Varnish, and Jinx is that those work uh, totally outside the core code of the application. You don't need to change essentially anything in your application to put this front caching ahead of you and handle more and more requests. Uh, towards the end, I think as the last segment of the presentation, I will give you a couple of points on, uh, one, on a couple of case studies, and one in particular makes its magic uh, because of front caching. But in, uh, when I'm not talking at, at conferences, uh, uh, I work for a company and we do business in professional sports. So we are exposed okay, to the working of websites that can be charged with uh, many, 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 many thousands of requests in a short amount of time. And uh, those websites essentially use front caching to do the job. So this is a, a sort of common, I don't know if it's best or not, but it's common practice. Front caching is uh, particularly effective, is more effective, to put another way, for essentially read-only front-ends. So if you have a news or a website that doesn't require interaction posting, 
but it's just about reading, maybe with asynchronous notifications, that is uh, uh, something that works. Because the idea is I show the same page static as it was a static plain HTML for a number, a configurable number of seconds, no matter how many million requests I can get in that amount of time, configurable amount of time. So for that configurable amount of time, the server receives uh, nearly no requests to handle. This is, the, this is the perfect example of having measured what is the growing factor and having found uh, an effective workaround. Horizontal scalability is all another kind of animal. It's mostly architectural. It's how you can expand your application, including the critical, especially the most critical parts of your application, how you can expand them without damaging other parts and without introducing incongruent data, inconsistency, and without violating business constraints. So it's about uh, multiple instances of the same application, web-wise. It's about uh, load balancing access to them. And it's about, uh, why not, data sharding. How you split your data between the multiple instances. Not all of them necessarily concur to the implementation of a scalable solution. But I would say that probably data sharding can be considered optional. It's there. You decide based on the context if you really need it. But multiple instances and subsequently load balancing are, I would say, kind of a must. Now, concretely, how would you go about, uh, which were my words I said? How you change, edit critical parts of the application, how you can expand and make them able to be used in multiple instances with a load balancer and perhaps using data shards. Let's see a few practices. Now, the first uh, operational practice that comes to mind is uh, removing bottlenecks, whatever you have. Yes, it's all about performance. Okay, scalability and performance are different things, clearly different things. But, okay, a slow application is not exactly great the ideal starting point for having a scalable system. So the first thing you want to do is making the application well done. So removing bottlenecks. What kind of bottlenecks? Well, essentially queries. This is the, if I have to identify the number one problem is uh, how you get data. And now there are many other side topics uh, related to this, one is, uh, okay, how you write queries or who writes queries? You or Entity Framework or an ORRM or this or that? Because, uh, well, ORRMs, Object Relational Mapper Tools, they do a fantastic job of simplifying developer's life. But they are like uh, IOC frameworks. Dependence injection frameworks, they are great. But they, they are essentially great because they allow us developers to achieve a lot with a single line of code. But the code doesn't disappear. The code is still there. There are quite a few CPU cycles being consumed be, behind. Now, oh, look, how, with a single line, I instantiate a graph of objects four levels deep. 
not all dependency injection frameworks are the same. There are, there were, I, would, I hope, dependency injection frameworks using reflection. It works, but it costs you a lot. And then there are dependency injection frameworks that use dynamic code generation using modern frameworks and, and, and solutions. They are much faster. So the benefit of using the productivity you gain by writing a single line of code and also the expressivity you gain in that, which has an impact on, when you, on what happens when you read the code back, those things are, are, are great to have. So the same happens for uh, object relational mappers. With uh, a link statement, uh, we can query and we can uh, essentially even ignore the costs of uh, joins, groups, and uh, complex uh, uh, SQL operations. Oh, yeah, it's the, it's the link provided that does that for me, which is true, but uh, not necessarily in the context in which you operate, the object relational mapper is the ideal tool. Uh, OK, too many words, an example. Concrete example. I'm not revealing any trade secret. Oh, 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 everything I'm going to say is totally, entirely public, and I heard personally this from uh, the voice of the author. Stack Overflow. You know Stack Overflow. It's uh, extremely, uh, it, it changed okay, the way in which people me program. We don't read documentation or accept very special situations. We just type in more or less a natural form of a language the question, the, the thing we want to know. And in some way, Google and will drive us to the point in Stack Overflow where the question is answered with full details. And we start from there to have the job done. Now, Stack Overflow, as you can see, has a quite a few performance problems. So they need to be really, really, really scalable. And even beyond scalability, they need to have, uh, in first place, a system that is extremely fast. And then a system that can be made faster and faster and faster to serve more and more people coming. They are famous to have not to use any ORM. Their code is mostly based on ASP.NET. It's an ASP.NET MVC application based on SQL Server as the database. And they don't use Entity Framework, which is uh, given the technology stack would be the most obvious natural choice. But at the same time, they don't write plain SQL queries, sort of. So th they have created a proper proprietary, but I mean proprietary because they did it, but actually it's open sourced, a micro ORM framework. It's called Dapper. And uh, this kind of thing works uh, in the way that they pass most of the time plain SQL queries or storage procedures names. And what they get back is, instead of a cursor or an abstraction for a database cursor, they get back an array, an, an I list or whatever, a collection of objects. So the, they essentially put into the ORM, in the micro ORM, just the logic that you know, extrapolates data from uh, the database reader into usable, comfortable objects. But for the most part, and especially for the most critical kind of queries, where the graph of objects is particularly problematic, they use views and SQL queries, and they take the most out of SQL databases. So now, Entity Framework, but also in Hibernate and whatever, ORM you can happen to use, they are great at doing job for they are, have been created, but they, they are not magic. They have a limitation beyond a, a level of complexity that you should figure out and that may be different on a per application basis. 
they stop being really, really effective. So they can originate really convoluted queries that can be solved with a different approach. Maybe creating a views in the database. Or maybe, I don't know, using some database level solution, using a, using a combined effort between the database and the code so that the same data is taken out of storage, brought in the application's memory effectively. So it's not necessarily the fact that an ORM generates uh, uh, suboptimal queries. It's how you query data. It's the, the algorithm. It's the query stack of your application. Query stack and command stack. CQRS. So splitting the two things sounds like to be a step, an architectural step in the right direction. And then beyond convoluted queries, convoluted query algorithms, more exactly, uh, initialization steps too long. So asynchrony, and then inefficient algorithms, if ever. So now, going through this practice uh, has a very high throughput. So if you go through this practice and you, know, you do this quite effectively, the results you get is pretty good. The cost of doing this. I, 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 I evaluated this as a medium cost because it's about uh, refactoring in the end. So refactoring is not free, but refactoring is not rewriting the app. So overall, I tend to consider this to have a medium cost. It's time consuming, for sure. And it's overall a delicate step because you are squeezing, you know, you are rock and rolling, you know, the structure of the application. Number two, this is much easier. Move some requests to other servers. Offloads requests, typically for static resources, sounds like to other services, for CDNs, the content delivery networks. Uh, sounds like a stupid thing to do, but it works. It's pretty effective. And it's not case that it's pretty common solution. Uh, thinking of CDNs, uh, depending on the type of application you write, uh, and based on my personal experience, uh, geographically distributed sites are extremely important. I mean, it happened to me quite a few times that services uh, we exposed to be consumed by mobile applications, but you know, I'm talking about pretty stupid services, just read, just a plain select columns from table and serialize to JSON and return uh, with a number of users that is in the order of a few thousands, so no huge numbers. Well, these applications and this infrastructure working beautifully in Europe fails dramatically in South America, so when we receive most of the calls from mobile apps deployed to users uh, in South America, or even worse, in China. Making calls, we, 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 we wrote the call from China, that there is the firewall to be passed in first place. And then there, it goes to New Zealand, to Los Angeles, and then finally to Europe. It takes a while, and sometimes many calls we found out, time it out. So geographically distributed sites and Azure or cloud solutions help immensely in this regard, help. But there's another aspect I want to call your attention on as far as uh, CDNs are concerned. Uh, images. Every website is uh, usually padded with images. But I'm not talking necessarily about images used for graphics, for styling, for CSS kind of things, but images that are functional to the working of the application, like user pictures or news pictures. Now, especially if uh, mobile users, whether app or mobile sites, are critical, you want to have uh, 
high quality images, but high quality for the resolution of devices. Uh, concretely, it's about having two or more copies of the image. You don't want to consume bandwidth and downloading four megs images, whether it's a desktop or even more, if it's a mobile that can still, in some situations, be connected over slow uh, networks. So maintaining multiple copies of the image, and look, it's a matter of size, but it, also, it is also a matter, in, for some applications, of content. Because imagine that you, know, you need to, to have a, a picture that represents the, the user profile, and the user uploads a picture in which, you know, picture in, it is 3,000 for 3,000 pixels, and uh, there is a forest in the background and a small face in the top corner. Well, okay, you, you can use that as the profile picture, but if it's critical for the app, face recognition, uh, you, you might want to you know, rework that picture. So someone has to do that. You expect the user to do that, but users will never do it. So some automatism to do that is uh, for cropping, essentially, in a smart way the image should be, is, is sometimes in order. And uh, you might want to consider, in addition to CDNs, uh, uh, softwares that in a way, manipulate automatically the image, uh, not to perfection, but to a decent level of service, uh, images uh, as they are uploaded to your, to your site. And uh, uh, usually these frameworks, I can mention one, it's called Image Engine. Uh, they use uh, device detection to figure out uh, the best way the best algorithm they can apply to resize the image. So consider CDNs that also have this capability or use libraries like this, like Image Engine, okay, if you uh, create or manage your uh, CDN. Uh, this is essentially a low throughput, so it, it doesn't improve dramatically things, but improves uh, a little bit, it's quick to set up and has a low cost of setting up. And more importantly, this improves the user's perception of the system. Now, this is another uh, level of caching, output caching, uh, that I mentioned mostly because I'm an ASP.NET guy. Honestly, I have no idea whether uh, this can be considered a feature uh, outside the world of ASP.NET, but actually it's a form of front caching that is uh, done at the application level. So output caching is uh, essentially a configuration of the endpoint uh, so that uh, based on parameters you receive, uh, the locale, so the language requested by the browser, or perhaps a custom data you configure, you essentially instruct the web server to maintain multiple copy, multiple static HTML-based copies of the page for the specified amount of time. If you go this way and you have a multi-tenant website, pay attention, for example, to the locale, and you typically want to use a custom data, so a custom logic to distinguish, because, well, again, uh, it happened to me once, I was a website uh, in Portuguese and English. I put output caching on. I, I was on a hurry because, uh, yeah, we, we were experiencing serious problems. So I put this on uh, it, it, because it's a quick operation. I put it on essentially live. And uh, I forget to imagine that because of output caching, it, it works like you know, the first request that hits after expiration is served and the content is cached. So it happened that the Portuguese user was the first and the page cache was in Portuguese that for the amount of time, for the minutes that the page was on, the caching was on, people from Portugal and English people were see, with, everybody was seeing the Portuguese page. So output caching is for multi-tenant and multicultural. Uh, websites uh, is a delicate thing to do, but actually it, it, it's, uh, 
it has a, a medium throughput because it's a way a form of front caching. Uh, low cost of implementation, very, very quick, because in ASP.NET at least, is mostly about putting an attribute, decorating a method on a class with, uh, with an attribute. Data caching is still about caching, but now this happens at the level of storage. There are plenty of distributed caches uh, which work on top of databases, and in some cases they, they work as the database, and they eventually persist data, Redis, scale out, and cache. Um, yes, any of those uh, works. I mean, it's very hard to say which one is to prefer, so I'm not making a comparison between, I'm not able to making a comparison. I mean, when I don't know how to show, which, which one to show, I, I, I usually take uh, the cheapest. So uh, Redis, Scaleout, and Cache are all products doing the same. I could even have the RavenDB, or there, there are many others there. But the point here is, uh, why is data caching uh, sometimes uh, uh, requiring uh, a special tool? Because of the, the problems uh, that may arise with web farms, so with multiple instances of the same application, that you set up in front of a load balancer to improve the ability, the number of requests your application can handle uh, in the unit of time. And uh, a web farm, of course, is an instance of the application. So the cache, the global memory of the application is on a per instance basis. And there is no, usually no guarantee that in the conversation between the user requests and responses are served, successive requests are served by the same server. So you might find that the first step of a process is served on computer one, and computer two will serve the future requests. So you might face a, a disalignment between, uh, between caches. So if uh, the cache you are concerned about is essentially read, made of read-only data, you can even arrange uh, an auto-updatable internal cache. So pieces of global memory that is, uh, that is uh, essentially read and, uh, the mo and, and set, if, no if not, I mean, you have a query. You save the memory, the memory, the, query, the results of the query on computer one. Computer two is empty. The first request on computer two will populate the memory, and over time, the memory is aligned. If there is anything that changes, the memory is invalidated, the cache is invalidated, and rebuilt on the successive request. As far as you have essentially read-only data, so the number of cache invalidations are not that many, that frequent, this approach reasonably works reasonably well. And uh, I mean, I haven't tried that on large websites, but actually, the, the point is not the size of the size and the number of the requests. The point is the auto-updatable model is working for you. So if data is essentially read-only, it works. The moment in which the number of changes to this cache are significant, then you, want to, you might want to use a truly distributed cache, which is a service outside the instances of the application, because an auto updatable internal cache is internal to each instance of the application. So it's a piece of global memory in the code you write. And you replicate this on multiple servers, the, the piece of global memory is replicated. And uh, the algorithm of accessing that ensures that the data is kept more or less in sync. And it's synchronized on demand if it is not. But if the number of updates is significant, you might want to switch to a distributed cache, which is an external service okay, that provides just a layer uh, of storage on top of databases. Proxy caching is uh, the front caching I mentioned at the beginning, installed uh, on fr in front of any website, uh, fully configurable, caching and load balancer in one single place. 
works essentially, again, if you have a relational data. And now, architectural practices. Because it turns out that to handle scalability really, really, really effective in an effective way, you probably need to start separating the command stack from the query stack, the CQRS architecture. Optimize stacks differently. High throughput, high costs, time consuming is a different way of thinking of things. Effective, but different way. It's about rethinking the app and to some extent rethinking your way of approaching software, whether you are an architect or a developer. Essentially, it's about moving from this canonical layered architecture, as we have uh, got it from uh, the domain-driven design uh, methodology presentation layer. This is the layered architecture from DDD. Uh, presentation layer, application layer, where you do orchestration of tasks, where you have essentially the implementation of the use cases. Workflows are here. Domain layer, where you have the pieces of the business logic, typically, but not necessarily, saved as uh, behavior in, uh, in objects, and then infrastructure, and the most important piece you have in the infrastructure layer, of course, is uh, repositories and the data storage, but you can have their email uh, or web services or whatever else. So it's about moving from this uh, monolithic well, monolithic is a bad word, uh, from uh, this single stack architecture to this one, in which uh, the presentation layer, even though in multiple forms, so mobile, web mobile, um, desktop, uh, can be many, but essentially it's conceptually is one application, one presentation layer. And then uh, there are two distinct stacks. The application layer is, uh, I would say, necessary in the command stack. So from the presentation layer, this is the foundation of software, uh, any operation in software can either be a command or a query. Nothing else in the middle. Black or white, command or query, that's it. Command if it alters the state of the system. If at the end of the command, whatever happens, query included, at the end of this operation, the state of the system is different. Query, whatever I do, even writing data somewhere, but at the end of the operation, the perception of the state of the system is the same as it was before. So this is the, the definition. So it's not about uh, I do a query and I do a SQL command. It's logically speaking, a workflow at the end of which the state of the system is different or the same. So if it changes, you probably want to go through a workflow. So you want to have here the application layer, the domain layer, and then the infrastructure. And commands go this way. It's in a, in a one direction. The state of the system somewhere here is updated. And then how it is updated opens up a whole new world of possibility, including even sourcing. Because all that you have to save when you start reasoning in terms of CQRS is, OK, I modified, I altered the state of the system. OK, now, how can I, what is the most effective way for me and for my application to persist the new state? You can take the snapshot route, as we typically do today, I just update all records involved. I just write on top of the existing values. It works. It worked for decades. But in doing so, unless I'm using special versions of Oracle or special versions of SQL Server that have a, a value tracking history enabled, unless that, I lose completely the value, the state it was before. But at the same time, CQRS opens up a whole new world of possibilities because uh, it gives me the granularity of the command 
that some user action triggers against the system. So I can start thinking of tracking the command. And what I save at the end of the brown arrow is what has happened. The current state as of now. So I stop having a customer, classic customer's relational table with one record per customer. But I have multiple, if I want to say in the relational realm, I will have multiple records per customer. One for when the customer was first added, and one for each time the customer record, any property, any column was updated. And maybe once for when the customer was deleted, and deletion would be logical. So I have everything tracked down in the command, in the command stack, in the storage for the command stack, but I miss the current state of the customer table. So what, given customer ID three, what is the current address? I don't know. I cannot simply run a query, okay, on the database I have to have it back. So if uh, the, the, the fact that we split CQRS and the architecture in two, in the, at the end of the command, I update the state, but uh, I must make sure that the updated state can be read back effectively. So either I use the regular snapshot approach of today, I just overwrite the same records, fine. Or if I choose even sourcing, so I keep track of the action, I have then in the same transaction, make sure that the database here, after once is updated, also updates another database used only for reads. So I can have a, a log database and a read model database where essentially I can, that I can query directly, quickly, without intermediation, and bring data up to the user interface. The purpose here. And uh, the query stack just has ready-made, tailor-made storage, and plain data access is performed, no logic. We don't need business logic here. We just need, we don't need a, even a model here. Just plain stupid DTOs, Tyler made for the UI, are usually okay. And this could be as simple as data binding. One tier old style data binding, but we have split things in two. And because they are split in two, they can even be configured as different applications. And because of that, they can be optimized independently. They could even be seen as two different microservices, sharing the database or sharing some way to sharing some data with some layer of code that keeps it, the storage in sync. The next step going in this architectural evolution is uh, having in the common stack the domain layer implemented as uh, as a, having a message-based logic, so every command that turns out to be a message sent to the application that originates some changes, and that this opens up a whole new world of architectural uh, considerations. But this is an architecture that is definitely going to be scalable. So in the end, uh, the design level, we have a business domain, domain-driven design, the analysis, we run that way takes us to split the domain in contexts, in micro applications, and the CQRS splits even more the context in the common and query stack. So the, what was the size, the original size of the monolith we had to work with uh, has become uh, out of analysis of a much, much, much smaller size each. And this is uh, to some extent even parallelizable in development. Single tier, coming to 
the cloud architecture, how this works with the cloud. Single tier and stateless servers. So one server, no session state, give, gives us applications quick and easy to duplicate and trivial to put behind a load uh, balancer. So we are moving essentially thinking with the cloud in mind from this schema to this one in which the middleware is provided by the host, the cloud host. We just have a, a single site with uh, anything in it. No session, no data except okay, uh, the, the, the database. And uh, that architecture is just a control C, control V, uh, copy, copy, pass, copy, pass, copy, pass, to have as many instances as you want up and running. And uh, depending on the features of the cloud host you use, uh, it's about uh, you know, spinning up a new instance uh, or shutting down an instance if you have too much. And then to finish off, a couple of things, a few comments about uh, how Stack Overflow handles that, the incredible amount of requests they handle. Notice that the numbers here are not really particularly updated, up to date. This is probably the situation a year and a half ago. So numbers are even greater and even more astonishing. It's for sure in the top 50 of most trafficked websites with at least 500 million page views in a month. And uh, the project uh, is uh, something like a few Visual Studio projects and uh, approximately 100,000 lines of code. Can you believe it? They have no unit tests, or nearly no unit tests. 0 0.25% 0 of code coverage. Not that I, I'm just reporting those not their numbers, just public. There's a link on the next slide. It's public information. MVC projects, ASP.NET MVC projects, and they deploy a few times a day. And the purpose is uh, move fast and break things as soon as possible. And in, an interesting consideration is that their, uh, their teams is made of a few developers but extremely smart. They don't have juniors. But what it matters. Caching is the secret weapon for uh, Stack Overflow. They have five levels of data caching, network, server. They use Redis, SQL Server, and also they use solid state disks. This information is uh, publicly available at the link over there. And finally, global.com. Different scenario. It's the largest portal an internet service provider in South America. A million views per day, at least twice as large as Stack Overflow. They do a lot. They do, do TDD has, a, um, has a, a directive. It's based on Python and Django. So one of the largest websites in the world is based on Python and Django for server-side code. Use MySQL, MongoDB, and Memcached. And reverse proxy caching. Thank you very much for your time. And think about scalability.